be hearing from Christopher Carmona and Juan P. Carmona. And up first will be Christopher. Uh, Christopher Carmona is the author of The Road to Yorona Park and three collections of poetry. We're here to celebrate the first book in his YA novella series titled El Rinche, The Ghost Ranger of the Rio Grande. The first book is a 2019 Texas Institute of Letters Best Young Adult Book Finalist. He teaches Mexican American Studies and Creative Writing at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley Brownsville. Please welcome Christopher Carmona. I'm going to have to raise this. Um, so I'm going to be talking, uh, before I start reading from the book, to kind of give you a, a little history about what this book is and where it comes from. Um, so the title itself, El Rinche, El Rinche is, a, is a term that's the, it's a reference to the Texas Rangers. Um, so the Texas Rangers, to a lot of uh, Mexican-American people, Mexican people, are not heroes. Um, they are basically the KKK of our community. <laughs> There's just no other way to say it. From their, a lot of their charge with the Texas Rangers has been to, you know, basically clear out the undesirables from Texas. And the undesirables usually translates to Native Americans and Mexicans. That's the original charge in 1836. So um, the Texas Rangers uh, themselves is something that's always um, kind of, for, for me growing up, um, was always this kind of cognitive dissonance from um, the myth that's portrayed out there, right, about who these guys are, were. And um, the, so this book is kind of is a response to that in a lot of ways. This myth about who the Texas Rangers were and then the fact that they keep on getting, myth, the mythology keeps on persisting and the fact that they're not even, they don't talk about the atrocities that they committed. Um, and so um, we're, this book takes place in 1905 down in the Rio Grande Valley, South Texas. Um, and around that time is a time that uh, is, is known as La Matanza, or the massacre. And from 1910 to about 1920 is when most of the stories put this time period. Is a time period when Texas Rangers and others um, literally just massacred. People estimate anywhere from 500 to 5,000 Mexican Americans in South Texas. This is state-sponsored violence, and it was about three years ago that the state of Texas finally admitted that they they were involved in state-sponsored violence against their own citizens. So this period between 1910 and 1920, um, what happens is the Texas Rangers themselves um, are mostly just an arm of American corporations and, and Anglo ranchers who were um, looking to take the land of these Mexican Americans who uh, were, were basically land, they own the land. So to kind of go back in history, um, the whole Spanish land grant thing. So when Spain came in, they granted you know, all of the Americas to 541 families. And over time, those got smaller and smaller. Um, so the area that, um, well, usually along the border that, uh, that, that you know, what I'm talking about, um, really belonged to about five different Mexican-American families. And they owned these lands, they were ranch lands. Um, they owned these lands and they ran these lands for about 300 years or so. So they were pretty independent. Um, they had their own systems of government, they had their own churches, um, and they had their own schools. And for about 300 years, these families were wealthy and they, they were prosperous and ranching. Um, what happens is at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, um, the, the America's economic system is very focused on agriculture mass production of agriculture. And um, so they target this land, this area, um, as a space to basically what we now consider terraform 
the landscape from what would be ranching to ranching landscape to agriculture. But, um, and so the state of Texas, this thing went off on me. Yes, that's kind of crazy. Anyway, so anyway, um, 1905, the state of Texas um, issues the Rio Grande Land and Irrigation Company a grant for $1.25 million to do exactly that, to terraform the land from ranching to agriculture. The problem is, all these lands are owned by prominent families that have owned these lands for 300 years, and they're not willing to sell. So, and uh, there's a lot of Anglo ranchers like the Kings and the Cleavers and the Sterlings who've been trying to get these lands for a long, long time. So what happens is that um, they go to basically the Gov Governor Ferguson because the Texas Rangers were a special branch of the governor's office. And um, uh, they're, they're trying to find a way to basically get access to these lands. Um, so, what the governor tells them is that, uh, they can, that the Texas Rangers can be used to try and get these lands. And any crimes or anything that they might perpetrate, that he will basically offer them a free pardon. This is the letter that came out. They wrote to E. E. Sterling, who was the rancher. And whatever they do, they will not be prosecuted. And this is what begins um, this um, the Matanza. Where there's massive, there's, there's lots of murders, lynchings, uh, straight up land theft um, that occurs for about. I start my clock starts about 1904, 1905 when the railroad gets down to that area. Um, and so my grandfather and my great grandfather they lived during this time, and my great grandfather um, had to take his family into Mexico um, for two years in the middle of the Mexican Revolution because it was safer there than it was on the side of the border. So our family is directly connected to the violence that occurred um, during this time. So that's, and I heard all these stories about the Vinches, that's what the, my, um, so my grandfather, well, Vinches Vinches is what they were called. But um, they heard these all growing up as a kid. Right? My grandfather would tell me stories as a kid, and when I was a kid, and um, you know, but as a kid, when I'm listening to these stories, I can't. I, don't, I never reconcile that these are the same Texas Rangers that were seen in the movies, and you know, the Lone Ranger, Walker Texas Ranger, all that stuff. It wasn't until I got older that that's that you know kind of started to come together for me. And so, really, what started this book was to tell this history, to bring it out to the world um, in a way. And there's a group called Refusing to Forget who has dedicated their group of historians and scholars to bringing this history out um, about the lynching of Mexican, Mexican Americans and uh, how, how many of the damage that was done during this time. And, um, and so there's a lot of their work that's kind of helped me write the history behind this book. But um, I'm a writer, so I, need to, I wanted to be able to tell the story in a different way. And so what really did this is I wanted to be able to bring um, a character, um, basically a superhero character, a positive figure <coughs> that is very lacking in literature, and especially YA literature, which is my target audience, um, basically because a lot of the younger generations don't know these stories. A lot of people don't really know these stories, but the younger generations in growing up in South Texas don't know these stories, and it's. You know, I, I know this because I heard him straight from my grandfather who lived during this time. Um, but the, the generation after mine, it's, it's almost been erased, right? Um, and so that was one of my charge to start these books. Um, so with the YA literature, young adult literature, um, there's a you know, pretty disturbing statistic that um, in young adult literature, Latinos represent 3% of all the characters in, Latino liter in young adult literature. Animated objects um, represent 13%. So there is a massive amount of lack of Latino characters within young adult literature. So that was my reason to kind of bring this into this area. So what this book is, um, Alinche, is a, is a superhero story, but it's wrapped in real history. Um, the major events that occur in the book 
um, or real incidents that occur. Of course, they're wrapped in, in fantasy. Um, but that's, uh, that's kind of the charge for the writing this, this novel. And the first one, this is a series of four. So um, in, this, in this book, the main character is um, son of a Mexican-American landowner whose family gets massacred. He's basically left for dead. And um, he's a light-skinned, green-eyed Mexican-American. This is important because of what they do to create this character. Um, and um, this is what happens is like he's found by um, two other people who are trying to track down. One of them is Taldos, who is kind of Native American, the leader of the whole um, organization. He's on a he's on a quest for vengeance against the, the, the ranger captain in the story, and Bass Reeves. So Bass Reeves, if you're not familiar with who he was, um, was the most successful lawman in U.S. history. He was African American marshal, U.S. marshal, and uh, he arrested over 1,400 people, and um, he was involved in like 14 shootouts, and he always got his man. And that, in Bass Reeves, is the archetype for the Lone Ranger. When they created the Lone Ranger in the 1920s, the two guys from RKO Studios, um, they were looking to write a radio show because radio was brand new. And across the street from our PF studios in Detroit was the federal prison. So they wanted to start interviewing these prisoners because they were thinking about doing a Western. And all of them said, there's this one guy <laughs> that you got to know about, and that was Bass Reeves. But it's the 1920s, and you can't make a black man a hero, so they say they gave him a black mask. But Bass Reeves, and he's a real historical figure, um, is, the, is the archetype for the Lone Ranger. And yet nobody really knows who he is. <laughs> Which is insane because he still remains the most successful lawman in US history. Um, and then so Bass Reeves barely he's barely getting some some um, play <laughs> in pop culture, but not a lot. But he's one of the major characters in this book. I bring him in here, he ends up trying becoming the mentor to the main character, one of them. Um, and so Bass and, and the main character uh, the other main character, Taldos, are there to they find him, and that's when they start to nurse him back to health. And they start to this quest, right, to start to fight the Texas Rangers. Um, and they create this superhero persona, right? Um, mostly to protect um, the, the, the community in a lot of ways. It's because he's, he's, uh, he's kind of a ghost ranger, that's kind of the persona. He's a ghost. He has ninja powers, and I'll explain why he has ninja powers. But um, <laughs> the, I'm going to read a little piece here first. Okay, so. This is a scene where the main character um, is still kind of in a coma, but he's, and he's, this is kind of a dream sequence. He's remembering what happened to him. Um, so it's called Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story. It was like swimming through air, but without arms, without legs, without body. It was just a song sung cruelly, more like a whistle a song he couldn't quite place, but it sounded like a train whistle trying to keep rhythm with the roar of the railway. It was his trip back home. It was a dream that was too real. It was a memory wrapped in gravity pulling him down to somewhere worse than hell. Mijito, your home, it was his mother, looking a bit older than he remembered, a streak of white hair in her brownish red hair. He stepped off the cart and let her hug him hard. Amma, it's good to see you, he said, like he had done this scene before. Come, let me get you something to eat. You look like you haven't eaten at all when, when you're up there in your fancy school. His mother pulled him into the main house, which was a large hacienda with too many rooms for, for the four of them. I'd made calabaza con pollo just cooked up. Calabaza con pollo was his favorite, and she knew it. The fresh smell of tortillas being, being made filled every inch of the house and every, in his every cell. As he walked further into the house, something happened, a cough. He coughed and he coughed and he coughed. He pulled a handkerchief from his pocket, covered his mouth and pulled it away to see a silver bullet. This is not how I remember it this day. So this is when he first starts to realize that he's in a dream. Um, so here is, um, this, he's trying, he's remembering coming home and he's starting to come to 
to, to I guess to to awaken from the fact that he's been basically shot and almost killed. Um, and as he's kind of coming to be the um, the people that are nursing him back to health, the two other main characters are trying to devise a way to use him in a way because he uh, when he was found. Um, he was with him and his family were basically tricked into helping the Texas Rangers catch quote unquote bandidos. Um, and so they basically put badges on all of them. And then when they got to a certain area, they ambushed him and they murdered him. And so he looks like a Texas Ranger. <laughs> so they think that they can use him to get to the captain and they realize who he is, that's when everything changes. Um, because he is light skinned and he has green eyes. So green eyes play a lot, a huge role here. So I'm gonna read this one part here. So this is a description of Choni. Choni is the main character. It's a short for an ascension. It's called Those Eyes. So it all started with those eyes. Esos ojos verdes. They were the first thing that most people noticed about Asuncion, Riz de la Plata, or just Choni to everyone who knew him. Those eyes were so piercing that his mother, Edlinda, swore she could always find him in the dark. They were a beacon on nights when all you could see for miles were stars blanketing the world. She could always see his eyes, curious, bright, to know so much like hers. Of the two sons she had, he was the only one who had her eyes. Choni was her little Juanito. His father, Daniel, would sometimes call him Blondie because his hair was almost blonde. His brother, though, Macario, would only call him Bolio and never Choni. He hated being called Bolio, but Macario was older and bigger and better at everything. Mercadio was tall, dark as coffee, and always good with horses, girls, and his fists. When he spoke, everyone listened. Daniel would always joke that Mercadio was always born a man. He was never a boy. Choni, though, was good at reading, running away from Mercadio's golfes, and for a reason he never understood, he was a natural pistol shot. He preferred the Colt 45, but he could shoot with any pistol. That was the only thing he'd do better than Macario, that didn't involve books. Macario would never shoot pistols with Tony, though. He was too busy being Papa's favorite son. Macario was supposed to run the rancho when Papa was gone. The Plata Rancho was set just north of Brownsville on the frontera for what used to be Mexico. The rancho was, a, was once a five million acre ranch granted to the Platas many years ago. But now it was only a few hundred acres dwindled down by American progress and Anglo squatters. Anglo progress was a slow steamroll that inched closer and closer. And as the railroad came to a close, um, came closer, Mexicano Tejanos, like the Platas, felt that the end of the 19th century brought an end to their way of life. Mercadio was supposed to be the great protector. Everything depended on him, and Tony knew it. So Choni buried himself in his books and spent much of his time alone and quiet. Daniel never paid much attention to him. Choni was Edlinda's Linda, boy. And Daniel never let Choni forget that. Even when he tried to join in and help with all the vaqueroing, Daniel would just yell at him to go back home with his mother. But all that changed. Um, on February 20th, 1890, it was Mercadio's birthday and Daniel had gone all out. Mariachi's pinata for the kids and even music goes for the night. Got too late for the wet goes. The fiesta was held in the courtyard of the hacienda where all the parties happened. The Platas employed several families on the rancho, but the kids never really liked him. Like Choni, he was too weird. So Choni would often hide in places no one looked, would look. That night promised to be different, so he prepared to spend the night reading. Then something happened. He saw something extraordinary. He saw them, those green eyes. But more importantly, he saw her. The vaya had kicked up. The clouds were so were so stubborn that the day that day the, they wouldn't even let the sun peek out at all. The night came early. All of the kids were running around at dusk, and for once, Choni was amongst them. He was just looking for a good spot to hide. But those eyes found him. Those eyes looking straight at his ojos verdes, and then they were gone. He almost didn't believe they were real. He looked around until he found them again. They came up to him and spoke to him in a little girl's voice. You, you're like me. Choni responded, no, you're like me. This little girl was wearing 
a boy's pants and a, and a boy's shirt. She had long black hair tied in the tooth and it's uh, Indio style. Those eyes. Her skin was uh, graphic when she had very well stirred and she looked like she was his age. She smiled at him and he smiled back. A grin so big at the corner of his lips almost touched his ears. From that moment on, their eyes and their lives became forever entangled. My name is Inez, short for Libyan Inez. My papa gave me that name to honor a long dead abuela I never met. Papa always said that I looked like her. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what he says. Abuela Inez, she took on Los Pinches Rinches to defend her ranch. It was, it was just an acre, but it was her land. It was all that we had left after the kings came. She would never give up. She defended her land one levels. It was just her and her papa who was too old to work. She always carried the shotgun she got from a drifting vaquero that spent the night once. They did more than sleep, papa always said. I don't really know what that means, but he always laughs. Abuela Inez only had 10 shells because that's all she could afford. And she only fired it once on the night they came for her, most leeches. She wouldn't sell her land, and so they came like the buoys in the night. Inez stopped and looked out toward the sky. The clouds had broken and she could see the stars. They seemed closer tonight, like they were listening. What happened next, Tony said. Inez stepped out of her daze and continued. She didn't scream, that's how she resisted. There were five of them. Tony swallowed hard, he didn't know exactly what she meant. He wasn't even sure she did either, but they both knew it wasn't good. Lo siento. Mi abuela, mi abuelo, the refugio, he works with your father. He told me that story. I was, I was only 10. How old are you now? 11. Nina said, matter of factly. And Tony smiles and said, I'm 11 too. Great. Anyway, uh, my abuela told me this. I don't know what it means. I hope that when I'm older, I will understand. But now, I just know the words. What are the words? Well, my abuela once said, our orphos feathers didn't come from some genetic misstep. They came from an act so hateful it sorrowed the color green forever. Tony just stared at her in wonder. They were deep words. He knew that. But he didn't really know what they meant. You see, Inez told Tony, my abuelo was her son. And the man that raised my abuelo was not his father. He always looked at him different. My abuelo and me, we have the same eyes and the same sorrow. Our flesh and our bone may be one thing, but our eyes are something different. How can something as beautiful as green eyes make me feel so shameful? That is what my abuelo gave me. That's when he gave me her shotgun, my abuela's shotgun. It is a reminder that I may, be, may stay strong like her, even when I'm not. Everything depends upon it. Tony would hear this several times throughout their, throughout their lives. Even though they shared the same eyes, they weren't the same. His came from his mother and hers before that. They had always been light-skinned. It was the Spanish blood, his mother had always said. Choni knew that it wasn't Spanish blood, though. He had heard the chisme. It was his abuelo's affair with the local, abuelo's affair with the local German boy, when the house was still Mexico. Forbidden love, never uttered, never legitimized, just whispered. It was his green eyes that first gave him the idea that he could pass. Years later, when Choni would study law at the University of Texas, he would realize how much those eyes could really deceive. The Anglos would often mistake him for one of them. It could have been the light skin or the light colored hair, but he knew it was the eyes. They would just assume he was one of them until he spoke. Then the rancho would spell out, betraying the deception with his ellos puestos and perros. Then they knew he wasn't one of them. He was an imposter. He betrayed them, appearing white when he wasn't the worst betrayal of all. They made him feel disgust for his Mexicanness. It didn't take him long to change his accent, sound more like them. He anglicized his name from Chony to Johnny, and when he came home, it was as, as if an Anglo sheath covered his Mexican tongue. A sheath he forgot how to dislodge. Only his mother's piercing scare could, uh, could dislodge the Anglo to free the Tejano in him. Those Alfos Vedas in the, the Vias del Norte were rare. Mexicano Tejanos and Mexicanos alike saw them as cancerous. The same way the Anglos viewed, viewed short, thick, curly, jet black hair, thick lips, and white nostrils. They were reminders of the past. They wanted buried, forgotten, and ignored. Those eyes, though, they were just too loud. <laughs>
That's kind of weird. Thank you. <laughs> so I guess we'll go and then we can ask who wants to ask questions. <laughs>